you have your Bibles, turn to us. Turn with me to Revelation 1. We're going to start verse to verse. Last week, we talked about signs of the times, and uh, just uh, it was so obvious every sign in Matthew 24 has already came true. So we are starting our walk through Revelation. And let me give you the outline for today if you have a bulletin. Number one, the human author. The human author. And again, I know it was from God, okay? I understand that. All right, but somebody had to pin that, and I'll share that with you in just a second. The promised blessing. Man, don't you like blessings? Man, that, that wasn't very convincing. <laughs> don't you like blessings? There we go. All right, number three, the central theme. Uh, the last few verses here that we will study, it is so obvious it's the central theme of Revelation. You know, uh, the book of Revelation reveals the end of human history as we know it, including the final setup of the world, the rise and power of the Antichrist, and the battle of Armageddon. It also reveals the coming uh, glory of Christ's earthly reign during the millennial kingdom, the great white throne judgment, plus shows us the eternal bliss of the new heaven and the new earth. It reveals the ultimate defeat of Satan and sin and his final sentence of eternal torment in hell. The overarching truth of Re Revelation is the majesty and glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation is one of the most exciting yet sobering books in the Bible. Let's get our spiritual eyes and ears open to this life-changing prophetic writing that describes in detail the second coming of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And let me give you some facts on Revelation. Uh, it had been 60 years since John had seen Jesus ascend into heaven. The Apostle John was uh, 90 years old when he wrote this book. Uh, he wrote it around A.D. 95. And when you say the Apostle John, we're talking about the brother of James. We are talking about the one whom Jesus loved. We are talking about the man who wrote the Gospel of John, who also wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John and Revelation. The Roman Emperor Domitian exiled John to the island of Patmos because he wouldn't swear allegiance to the emperor. In that day, there was much persecution of the church. Patmos, uh, Patmos was a rocky, barren island 40 miles off the coast of Asia Minor. It was a small island 10 miles by 6 miles long. There are over 300 references to the Old Testament found in Revelation. There are seven blessings or beatitudes found in uh, in Revelation. The first one is in the first part of our scripture. And in my opinion, and you're going to hear me say this, all right, in my opinion, we're not always going to agree on what the book of Revelation says. There's a lot of symbolism. There's a lot of things, uh, you know, and, and even my own father and I, we disagreed, and I'll point that out here in just a few minutes on, on something. But if you think about how God set up time, the seven days of the week, and, you know, there's been estimates of how old, the, you know, the world is. But in my opinion, uh, I believe it's around seven, a little over 7,000 years old. And I want to break this down. The Old Testament uh, was around 4,000 4, years. The New Testament, around 2,000 years. In the millennium, 1,000 years coming. And you say, what do you base that on? Second Peter 3. Look at 2 Peter 3 for me, if you would. 2 Peter 3, verse 8. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. And the reason I bring that up at the first is because I am telling you folks, this could happen any day. I believe the rapture of the church is the next thing's on God's prophetic calendar. And also, there are three opinions on when the rapture will occur. I am a tree-prib, tree a pre-tribulationist, all right? I believe the rapture is the next thing. There are a tribulationist, and that will happen in the middle of the tribulation. Some believe that after the three and a half years, right then, the rapture will occur. And by the way, that's, where, that's what my father uh, thought 
and also a pastor in Cameron Baptist Church where I grew up. He, that was his opinion also. And then there's a post-tribulationist, and uh, it is after the tribulation. And I am a pre-tribulationist because of two things. The first thing is because of Revelation 3.22. After Revelation 3.22, the church is not spoken of again. And then the Scripture in Revelation 3.10. Revelation 3.10. Look what it says. Because you have kept my command to preserve, persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on earth. So I think Scripture backs pre-tribulationist up. Angels appear in 20 of the 22 chapters of Revelation. The word angel is used 71 times in the book of Revelation. Revelation uses more symbols than any other book in the New Testament. And the Old Testament books that prophesy the future found in Revelation are Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and Zechariah. And uh, we will study parts of this as we go through here. And the way I like to do it is verse by verse, and uh, we will interject these scriptures as we see necessary. I am not trying to give you lots and lots of details. My goal is that if a ninth grader was sitting in this room here, that they could relate to and understand what we are trying to teach this day. So let's look at Revelation Revealed, Revelation Revealed, Revelation 1, verse 1. In the revelation of Jesus Christ. And right there, folks, revelation means to make or unveil something, to unveil something. And it's the revealing. In the Old Testament, we've seen scriptures where in the Old Testament it is not to be revealed yet. But he is saying in Revelation, this needs to be taught. We should not be afraid of it. Revelation is about Jesus Christ. It is about the end times and what is going to happen. And folks, we don't need to stick our heads in the sand. We don't need to act like this is not going to happen. Folks, this will be the end of the world as we know it now. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show to his servants. God initiated. God inspired it. Jesus. Notice the him there. That's a capital H, which means Jesus showed him and his servants things which must shortly take place. And you say, even in history, what do you mean shortly? It's been forever, all right? Shortly means it is for certain. You can take it to the bank. It's going to happen. So that's what he's saying, and we need to be ready, as we spoke of last week. And he sent and signified by his angel to his servant, John. All Scripture is inspired by God, is inspired by the Holy Spirit, and he sent it to mankind. Signified it means he authenticated it, okay? A signature in our days would be a signature on a check or a signature... Uh, when you write, uh, you know, bills out and things like that. And it's from God. God's hand is on it. God sent it to us as a personal letter to his, to his angel and to his servant John. Folks, that, that right there, you can see where it's unique in that. All right, normally he doesn't have angels deliver that. But he did, and we know that angels are messengers of God, and we already talked to about his servant John, who bore witness to the Word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ. What does it mean? Folks, John was with Jesus. John heard all that Jesus said. John recorded in the Gospels of John, in First and Second and Third John. John did all that. He knew him personally. He knew who Christ was. He saw the miracles. He saw what Christ could do. And it says, uh, to the testimony of Christ, to the things that he saw. And when we look at this, folks, I'm telling you, 
there are going to be some amazing things that we're going to see. I'm telling you, really, if you take it, uh, I, I do not understand somebody, and I've, I've heard of one or two lost people say this. Here's what they said. The Bible is boring. Well, folks, you haven't read it too well is all I can say. When I get to Revelation, and I understand it's confusing to some folks, but I tell you the biggest mistake people make in reading the Word of God is we try to conquer Scripture and not study Scripture. I'm all for reading the Bible through in a year's time. I'm all for that. Not every year, but I'm all for that. But it, you cannot consume that much Scripture in a year's time. And we, as Christians, need to slow down, read the Bible for what it says, and take our time. That's why it's so important, so important, folks, uh, that we have the Word of God and we have the Old Testament and the New Testament. There are preachers here today, and, and not here, but in this day and time that says the Old Testament is outdated. Folks, it's not. It's the divine Word of God. And we need to take those Scriptures from the New Testament and compare it to the Old Testament and learn more about that. And we need to take uh, uh, you know, the, the Scripture from the Old Testament and the New Testament and learn about that. That's what John is saying. Look at Revelation 22. And what I'm doing today is, is I'm giving you a snapshot of the end so you will know I am not teaching the Scripture today. I'm simply reading the end. And, and folks, I know you've done it too. You went to a book, you looked at the stuff, and then you looked at the last part of the book to find out what it is. You say, well, Brother Mike, why are you doing that? So you can get excited about what's coming. We ought to be excited about Revelation. We ought to be excited about the rapture of the church. We ought to be excited about us coming back with Jesus and watching him destroy the enemy. Amen. Now look at Revelation 22, verse 8. Now I, John, saw and heard these things, and when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. And again, I don't think John was worshiping the angel. I simply think he was so caught up in Scripture and so caught up in these things that the, all he knew how to do was fall down and worship. And folks, I believe that's exactly what we do, what we're going to do. When we go through the doors and the gates of heaven, I believe when we see Jesus Christ, we will just fall down at his feet. Amen. And it says, then he said to me, see that you do not do that, for I am your fellow servant and your brethren, the prof brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book, worship God. Folks, I am telling you, heaven will be the supreme place to worship. Amen. You can't imagine what it's going to be like with that many people who are saved, singing courses and praises to God. That's why we come here on Sundays. We're not, we're not here for a performance. We're not here for a show. We are here to worship God, Amen. to find out what God says, to listen to the Word of God, to worship Him because He is worthy of our worship. Amen. And He said it to me, do not seal the words of this prophecy of the book, for the time is at hand. Oh, folks, we have to unseal Revelation. We have to not be afraid of Revelation. We need to let people know what is coming. And he who is just, who, who is unjust, let him be unjust. He who is filthy, let him be filthy. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy. What is he saying? People are going to be people. They're going to, people, they're going to be people that reject your gospel presentation. And folks, you can't change them. The only thing that can change a lost man is the Word of God and the Spirit of God. So our job is not to save people, it's to present the gospel of Christ so they might be saved through the Holy Spirit. So don't get discouraged 
If there's some people say, "Ah, I don't believe that junk, just share with them. Just share your heart of what God tells you to say. So we see the human, the human author was the Apostle John. And again, I, I just cannot imagine being on an island, being in isolation. And I'll tell you another thing, and we're, we're kind of afraid of this word too, but if you look at it carefully, he saw many of these symbolisms through visions. Through visions. In the Old Testament, there were lots of visionary folks. Now, we can relate those to dreams today, but folks, you, you better be good at discernment, okay? Uh, Satan, the Bible says, can be an angel of light also. Know that it, this is from God. This it lines up with the Word of God. And I am telling you, John had these visions, and it is one of the most amazing books, the book of Revelation in the Word of God. So we see the human author. Number two, we see the promised blessing. Look at verse 3. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. Folks, blessed means happy. And I told you earlier, there's seven beatitudes in Revelation, and we will cover all of those. But notice the three things here and how we can get blessings. The three things. Blessed is he who reads. You have to understand, in the time uh, that, that this was written, all right, there weren't printing presses. Usually each church, and we'll talk about the seven churches uh, in the second chapter of Revelation, but there was only one copy of the Word of God there. And so someone had to get up and had to read that aloud. And the other thing you have to understand is there were a lot of people that couldn't read in those days. They didn't even know how to read. So the reading of the Word was important. So blessed are those who read the Word and those who hear the words. What good would it do you to come here and not listen to what the Word of God says? Folks, if that, we're just attending church. We're not worshiping. We can hang out. You can, you can do that at home. You can turn your TV on and, and, and just listen. But if we're not hearing what He is saying, so there is one who reads. There is one who hears. And, and really, the, the Word of God, even in the Old Testament, says, thus saith the Lord. It's not my words. And I know God is, I, I know I am God's spokesperson. But that's why we go down line by line and verse by verse and say, thus saith the Lord. So the one who reads is important. The one who hears the words of this prophecy, and here's another important, and keeps those things which are written in it for the time is near. And what is he saying? You're not going to be blessed if you don't keep the words of God in your heart. The Old Testament says what? There's a blessing and there's a curse. The blessing is to those who obey God. The curse is to those who ignore God or thinks it's not important. So he is saying revelation can be a blessing to you a blessing to you. And here's the word again, the time is near. And I, I, I would substitute near for the time is certain. These are going to happen. Matter of fact, uh, when we talk, uh, well, well let, me just, let me just move on here, all right? The promised blessing. Um, let's see, Revelation 22. Look in Revelation 22. Sorry about that. I lost my point there for a second. Revelation 22, verse 18. Revelation 22, 18. For I testify to everyone hears, who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. And if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. Folks, God's word is not to be messed with. Okay, there are a lot of paraphrased copies of the Word of God. You need to be careful that there is a right interpretation in those. Some of the paraphrased versions are this man's opinion. And again, 
You know, I, I heard a man say one time, opinions are like ears. Everybody's got two of them, okay? Just because somebody gives you an opinion, that doesn't necessarily mean it is right. Because there are some people that say, we do not need to take revelation literal. Well, folks, there is a lot of revelation that we need to take literal. And some of it is symbolic also. And being filled with the Spirit and having the Spirit of God in you. Okay? And folks, I am telling you, uh, you know, uh, one reason people cannot understand the revelations is because, a revelation is because, uh, you know, they are not Christians. Okay? They don't know Christ. And when they read this thing, it's just totally confusing. And I'm not talking about new Christians. Okay? I'm not talking about babes in Christ. But God's Spirit, God's Word comes alive when we read it and study it. So we do not need to add anything to. And look at verse 19. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things that are written in this book. And there are religions that use this verse, and they say you can lose your salvation. But folks, I've always said, once saved, truly saved, always saved. I've seen people walk away from God for a while and come back to God and be fruitful in that walk with God. But these, and what he is talking about is somebody that has, and, and folks, Matthew chapter 7 talks about false professions of faith. Matter of fact, it says there are many, many that say to me, Lord, 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 have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name? Have we not done these things in your name? Well, folks, it's not about me. It's not about my spiritual resume. Do I know Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. And the point of this is you don't mess with the Word of God. It is God's Word. He wrote it, and we don't need to change it. So we see this promised blessing. And then the third thing we see is not only the promised blessing, but the central theme. The central theme. Look at verse 4. John, to the seven churches, who are in Asia, and we will be talking about those in just, just a few weeks. Grace and peace from him. And again, that's a common, you know, uh, you know, greeting. Grace and peace from him who is, who was, and who is to come. Who is he talking about? He's talking about God. And I understand you can interchange God and Jesus but we're going to put Jesus in there at the end of our Scripture today. Who is God? Who is He? From Him who is. Folks, He is Jehovah God of this Bible. He is the Eternal One. He is the Creator of the world. Who was? He always was. He wasn't created. He's always been. And who is to come. I am telling you, God will have the last say at what happens on this earth. Amen. And from the seven spirits who, who are before his throne. And by the way, you see God here, and in these next three verses, you will see the Trinity also. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And what are these seven spirits? And we understand there's just one Holy Spirit, but there's attributes of the Spirit. And we need these attributes in our lives to make correct decisions. Hold your finger there and go to Isaiah chapter 11 with me. Isaiah 11 in the Old Testament. Isaiah 11 verse 2. The seven attributes are here in verse 2. Notice what he says, the Spirit of the Lord. We have the Holy Spirit inside of us. We can make the right decision every time if we listen to the Spirit. The, Holy, the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The Spirit of wisdom, we all need the Spirit of wisdom. Wisdom is knowing the mind of God. We need these things. The Spirit of understanding, the Spirit of counsel, the Spirit of might, the Spirit of knowledge, and of the Spirit of the fear of the Lord. 
Folks, that is everything we need to succeed in life and spiritually. God has given these things to us. They are sent down from heaven. We have these things available. But what I see these days is we get distracted so easily. All right? Our mind has trouble focusing on Scripture and focusing and meditating on the Word of God. And folks, that's Satan. Satan does not want you to know the Word of God and live the Word of God and breathe the Word of God in. So we have to have these. And, and the seven spirits who are before the throne, from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, and he has always been faithful, the firstborn of the dead. Now, he, hasn't, he wasn't the firstborn to die and be raised from the dead. Okay, we had Old Testament folks that had done that. But I'm telling you, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the greatest resurrection known to mankind. It changed everything. He was firstborn. He was raised from the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth. And he is the ruler. Sometimes uh, people think, you know, uh, I've even heard people say, where is God? I can tell you exactly where. He's in heaven. Why doesn't God care? God does care. Folks, it's mankind. Mankind, is the pro that is the problem. We are inundated with sin, and we make wrong choices. But I'm telling you, God is in control. He's in control of your life today, and he is certainly in control of the end times. And then it says, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. What is Jesus Christ about, folks? He is about salvation. Salvation. I'm telling you, the virgin birth of Christ changed the world. Man, we better defend the virgin birth of Christ. It is everything to who we are. It's the central focus of what we believe. And also that he lived a perfect life. And that he died on the cross, but he didn't stay in the grave. After three days, he arose. And it says, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. And again, kings, uh, we are going to reign with him. And priests, <coughs> we believe in the priesthood of the believer. This is so, so important. And it says, to God the Father, to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Now look at verse 7. Man, this is exciting. Behold, he is coming with clouds. Oh, folks, we need to keep our eye on the eastern sky. We need to keep our eye on heaven. All right, I know we have to live here, but we need to be thinking about heaven. I'm telling you, I cannot wait to get to heaven. And we know even with clouds uh, in the Old Testament, it was a cloud by day it, and, and a fire by night is talking about the presence of God. And now here he is talking about the second coming, not the rapture of the church. It says, in every I will see him. Oh, folks, I am telling you, he is talking about Jews and Gentiles. Those Jews basically sold him out. I, remember, I understand that the Romans carried out the crucifixion, but it wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for those lost Jews. So the Jewish nation, they are guilty. And then it says, every eye will see him, and those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth were mourned. And he's talking about Gentiles here. The Gentiles, everyone will see. I'm telling you, when he comes back, everyone is going to know who he is and what he is about. And the ones that are going to be mourning are those who don't know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. They are going to finally say, man, I messed up. Folks, I'm telling you, that's why it's so important today to know that you are saved. When you die, the choice has already 
been made. I had a guy tell me, man, when I hear that trumpet sound, I'm going to fall on my knees, I'm going to repent of my sins, and I'm going to ask Jesus to come in my life. What does the Bible say in 1 Corinthians 15? He will come in a twinkling of an eye. You know what that is? One one thousandth of a second. Nobody talks that fast. <laughs> Nobody can do that. That's why this is the warning. We are warning you. If you die and go to hell, folks, it's your own fault. God has given you every opportunity to be saved. They will mourn. They will regret and they will be in torment the rest of your, their lives. Even so, amen. Verse 8, this is Jesus' words. I am the Alpha and the, uh, the Omega, the beginning and the end. Oh, folks, Jesus started all this. John 1.1 1, 1 says he was in creation. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit was in creation and he will end it all. Says the Lord, here's that same verse that we saw earlier, who is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, folks, who was the one who died for our sins, and who is to come. We are going to see him in his majesty. And notice the last word there, the Almighty the Almighty. Oh, folks, it is going to be amazing when God comes, when He comes. We don't have time to go there, but sometime today, read Luke 21, verse 25 through 28. It is Jesus talking to the disciples and telling them, hey, this is going to take place. He had warned them earlier when He was there teaching them. But turn to Revelation 19. And we close this part of the service with Scripture. Revelation 19. And I want to peel back what if we're talking about, the second coming of Christ. So you can get, and again, I'm just reading that. I'm, I, we will study it and we will talk about it. But I want you to see what John saw. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like flame of fire. His head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dip, dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen and white and clean, followed him on white horses. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He will judge them. There's no mercy at this point. He comes to destroy Satan and his enemies. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of the Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh the name written, King of Kings, and Lord of Lords. My friend, this is going to happen. This is real life. It's not something in the future that's not going to happen. The Word of God teaches this. And Jesus came the first time in humiliation, but He will return in exaltation. He came the first time to be killed, but He will return to judge and to kill His enemy. He came the first time to serve, but he will, he will return to be served. He came the first time as a suffering servant. He will return as the conquering king. My friend, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess Jesus is Lord to the glory of God. Amen. Folks, God loves you so much. He loves you so much. He created heaven for you. He created. God doesn't want to spend it by himself. He wants his people 
there. But He has given mankind a choice. And I am telling you today, you need to choose Jesus Christ if you don't know Him as your personal Lord and Savior. It will be the greatest decision that you ever make. Father, thank You for this day. God, I thank You for the book of Revelation. and God, I thank You for just the truth of Scripture. And God, Revelation shouldn't scare us. God, it should encourage us. Should it help us to understand how things are going to end. It's going to help us to know that we need to be better Christians and we need to live for You. So God, I pray, Lord, that You would just do a work in the lives of our people. God, I pray that they would just stop and focus on You. I pray that they would look at their own spiritual life their own walk with you, nobody else, no judging, no looking around. And God, I do believe the time draweth nigh. So God, I pray we'll be ready. God, we look forward to that day when you rapture us out of here. And I have to say, and this is my, just, just what I believe, even so come now, Jesus Christ. We love you, we praise you. This is your invitation, this is your time. God, I pray that we would surrender to your will. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come? We thank you for joining us this morning at Rye Hill Baptist Church, and may God richly bless you.